congregation, we find our text in 1 Thessalonians 5. And now we pick it up at verse 19. Verse 19 to 22 are the words of the text for the sermon this afternoon. And we read there, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Congregation, following the sermon, the beginning of our response is done by singing together, and the words will be of hymn three, the stanzas one and two. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I made a point about the final instructions in this letter not being a box of individually wrapped chocolates enjoyed to be enjoyed individually. Indeed, it's not a mixed bag of nuts, but they're rather practical application of the whole letter. You remember, one way or another, that with a view to Christ's return, the Apostle gave the threefold command to rejoice, to pray, and to give thanks always. Now we hear what not to do. Paul now charges congregation with the three do-nots. For the danger for every Christian is to know the Word, but not apply it. The danger for every Christian is to assume to know the Word, and to ignore it. The danger for every Christian is to presume that the Spirit is content no matter what. And that should never threaten us so that we succumb to it. We are warned, do not, three times. And about that I preach you the Word of God. The theme of the sermon is the church awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ is charged with the three do not. Do not oppose the Spirit's person. Do not despise the Spirit's word. Do not reject the Spirit's work. So I proclaim to you the church awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ is charged with the three do nots. Do not oppose the Spirit's person. Do not despise the Spirit's word. Do not reject the Spirit's work. Congregation, brothers and sisters, the letter to the Thessalonians deals with the Thessalonians' understanding of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it must have been a shock, a source of amazement for the apostle to discover that that congregation had become what they had become because he doesn't remember leaving them. It is an amazing contrast. In chapter 2, he says, and we thank God constantly for this, that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the Word of a man, but as what it really is, the Word of God. You became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. That was then. But after they were so excited about the gospel, guess what happened? They suffered under the consequences of having to embrace that gospel because the gospel and you fully embracing it has consequences. 
you'll be marked. And so the apostle refers to that in chapter 3 when he says, so that's why we sent Timothy to you, our brother and God's co-worker for the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by those afflictions. So Timothy encouraged the congregation, he had a special mission. And afterwards, we read in the same chapter 3, that Timothy reported back favorably. But the disconnect was still there. And that's why we read in chapter 4, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Well, that is always a concern. As long as we are in the flesh, it is possible to become doctrinally quite convinced and convincing while your walk of life barely shows what you believe. That's why the Apostle said, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. So that is the theme of the letter, the walk of life as it is a translation of the gospel in every day. And it's not surprising that the Apostle makes a point of that. For one, the congregation of Thessalonica is a young congregation. Not only were they fresh in the doctrine, but, as I indicated before, whenever they lived by it, when they were excited and they, they went on their way, it caused suffering of varying degrees. That is why, as we saw this morning, the Apostle has spoken about the will of God for them in all circumstances. Obviously, it's about the translation thing that what you know has to show. What you confess determines what happens in your life. The words of the gospel and the walk of the gospel, they must be synchronized. And the Apostle, having had his own learning curve to become an Apostle, has learned this from the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself said something in Matthew 7. He said, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of My Father who is in heaven. And then the Lord Jesus goes on and says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I continue to quote, and then I will declare to them, that's the Lord Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The Lord Jesus, in that statement, identifies that what you know has to show, that the doctrine has to translate into walk. The congregation was not unfamiliar with the connection between the words of the gospel and the works of the gospel. We know that from the New Testament. The Spirit constantly had confirmed the words of the gospel. We read, for instance, about that in Acts 5. I just quote, and it speaks for itself. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. There's a man like Stephen, the deacon, and it says of him in chapter 6 of Acts, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Mark writes about it in chapter 16 when he says, They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. So the Holy Spirit 
was deeply involved in all that. That he confirmed what the word had said so that there would never be anyone who would disconnect the word from the works. The Spirit was involved. He had a personal interest in that. He who was personally poured out is personally involved in that. I'm not making it up because Peter teaches us this. When he talks with Ananias and Sapphira, when they were deceptive in the behavior and lied, then he says, you didn't do it to us. You had the right to organize your finances the way you wanted to, but this was actually very personal for the Spirit. You lied against the Holy Spirit. The sin was not just a lie, but a personal offense to the third person in God. Because the Holy Spirit is personally involved in what's happening in the church. He is given to the church. And for that reason, Paul warns the congregation of Thessalonica, do not quench the Spirit. Note this. He does not say, do not quench the Spirit's fire. He could, but he doesn't. This is not about the manifestations in tongues of fire or something like that. This is not about the things that come from the Spirit, but this is about the Spirit Himself. That talks about the Spirit being personally involved. The Spirit who has been poured out as the gift and the giver. The Spirit who is personally given to the congregation. The Spirit, the third person in God, didn't we hear it when Maverick was baptized? He has a personal stake in the matter. He makes a personal commitment in the matter of salvation. So this is not just about the gifts of the Spirit, but in the first place about the person of the Spirit. And therefore, to, to ignore him or to offend him is a serious thing. Stephen who had the Spirit move him to all these great signs and wonders, says to his fellow countrymen, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Paul does the same thing when he talks to the Ephesians. You know chapter 4, verse 30, that deep text where it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul doesn't say, do not ignore that you have some gifts. No, he says, the Spirit will, you can grieve Him. I could spend some time on that. I could give you another sermon if you're available tonight. No, just kidding. The point is this. The Holy Spirit is your friend. And you can grieve Him. He's personally involved. In fact, in the Old Testament already, David after he sinned dramatically with Uriah and Bathsheba, he's keenly aware of the fact that he didn't just make some mistakes. But he says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. See, that is also the sin that killed some members in that first Christian congregation in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. So this is the first do not for the congregation awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not quench the Spirit. What does that mean? It means do not frustrate the Spirit. I quote Ephesians 4. Do not grieve the Spirit. Do not ignore the Spirit. One would do that by not acknowledging that the Spirit is at work in the midst of the church. One would do that, but not realizing that the Spirit has a personal stake in the matter of your salvation. Remember your baptism. One would do that by thinking that salvation is a matter of theory and words and interesting things for later, but has nothing to do with you as a person or your relationship with the Spirit. Quenching the Spirit is like turning your back on someone and saying, 
He's not there. I don't even listen to him. Someone who sits right beside you. Who's there as your friend. Who's there to help you. To impart to you what you have in Jesus Christ. And who has said, I will take care of you and you and you and you and you. The Spirit came to earth so that we all together, as the bride of Christ, would harmonize with the bride so that the Spirit and the bride together will say to the Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. That's what Jesus is waiting for, Revelation 22. And so we turn to the second point. The congregation is also charged with a second do not. Do not despise the prophecies. Do not despise the Spirit's word. I summarized this part of the sermon. After having spoken about the Spirit's person, the Apostle now speaks about the Spirit's word. For that is one way in which the Spirit expresses Himself. The one, the author of Scripture, has a word for us. Now, in the early days of the church, the Spirit expressed Himself in different ways. We read that in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. And Paul mentions them all. But you've noticed he highlights one as more important the prophecy. We've heard how important that prophecy is. It's the one you have to desire the most. Because the one who speaks in prophecies speaks to build people up and encourage them and, and, and give them comfort. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. Because the one who prophesies, I quote still, is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless <coughs> someone interprets. And here's the reason. The church must be built up. So prophesying is highlighted as more important, more than any other gift. It's almost as important as the apostolic preaching, but it's not the same. It's distinguished. So what then is that prophesying all about? It is important, according to Paul, but what is it? Let me ask the question differently. Is it still applicable for us? Do we have it? How do we have it? Well, the apostle speaks, whenever he speaks about prophesying, about the mysteries of the kingdom. I'll give you a few quotes but you'll pick up the leading thought here. 1 Corinthians 13, if I have prophetic powers, and then he explains, and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge. So it is about understanding the mysteries of the gospel. Now, in the Bible, mysteries are not deep hidden things that we can't figure out and we sort of roll our eyes. No, they have to do with deep things with the plan of salvation that God has. You read that in Romans 11.25, Romans 16.25. So when God explains the way He worked His salvation for the Gentiles, it's called a mystery. When Paul speaks about the resurrection, he speaks about the mystery. The apostles are calling themselves the stewards and servants of the mysteries of God. And so there are many more texts that speak about the mysteries, and every time it is about how God brings salvation to you. Well, that will of God to save people through Jesus Christ and to keep people saved by the power of the Holy Spirit, that was not fully recorded yet. We have a bigger Bible than the early Christian church. There were still those who brought the plan of God of, of salvation to the congregation. 
And so you can think of the Old Testament prophets. What did they do? They didn't bring anything new. The new thing was revealed by Moses at Mount Sinai, the law of God. But then in Canaan, the prophets brought the point of the law home. And so in the New Testament, the mystery of the gospel is revealed in Jesus Christ. That's the proclamation of the apostles. And then the prophets drive the mystery of the gospel home. That's what prophets did. They explain the will of God. They apply the gospel to everyday life. They were those who edified the church. They do the daily upbuilding of the congregation. What was explained was the means of getting the Word to works. It is what the, the Apostle has done in this letter to the Thessalonians. Because the Word, those idlers, they needed to be reminded that what they heard needed to become work. There were those who did not pay attention to their daily walk of life. There were some who were frozen in a video still. And so the Spirit has given that gift, that excellent gift, to explain what the gospel means for everyday life. All the other gifts were less important, Paul says. They were not unimportant, but less important. They had, the, they had temporary value. But the gift of the explanation of the will of God for daily living has value for a much longer time because it will get you to the end to be recognized by the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that is still applicable. That is also happening for us. The work of prophecy has not ended. The will of God is still explained to you. The congregation of Christ still needs direction in the walk of life with a view to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Because we know who we are. There's always the need for the application of the gospel. There's always that need for getting from the doctrine to the daily living. And so the Holy Spirit is still working through people to explain the will of God. You may indeed think of the preaching of the Word. The Spirit uses a person to explain to the congregation of Christ the mystery of God so that they know what that means in their daily walk of life, so that they will walk to the end where Christ will welcome them in His kingdom. So in practical terms, my brother and sister, it means that the second do not is about what do you do with the preaching? What do you do with the daily application of the Word? When you sit in church, but don't do anything with the Word when you come home. Seriously. Ask yourself whether you are despising the prophecies. For when you are despising the prophecies, when you despise the Word of the Spirit, you are also opposing the person of the Spirit. You are ignoring the One who is on track with the church to Christ's return. And so we come to the third point. A third do not shown in that good and evil statement. Test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. This means that there must be responsible reaction in your life to the person and the word of the Spirit. And I call that the work of the Spirit. What does that do in your life? Well, the first thing that we see is that the Apostle comes up with those 
commandments, those three times do not. That requires action. For it states, do not. It doesn't state, do nothing. Doing nothing means that you will slide back. Now, considering how we are by nature, we would involve ourselves in all forms of evil. Considering how we are by nature, we would not hold fast to what is good. Considering how we are by nature, we would despise whatever is told for our correction. Considering how we are by nature, we would oppose the Spirit every step of the way. But that should not be. We should test everything in order to hold fast to what is good. To test everything. That does not mean, as some have made it out to be, that you can do whatever you like, that you can experiment with a lot of things, that you test everything and pick through the results and keep what is good. That is a bad explanation that functions often as a justification when people are caught in certain types of behavior which you're confronted with. You know where I'm going with this. When people get into the scene, when they begin to experiment to, to, to smoking stuff or using chemicals, they engage in immorality, then one would say when God, does it not say in the Bible somewhere that I have to test everything so that I can find out what is good or bad? Well, that's absolutely not the meaning of the text. That's an adulteration of this text. Because it's not about getting into trouble. This is about testing what you hear. It is about determining the quality of the prophecy. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 14. We didn't read it, but it's in verse 29. When he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. So, weighing... That's interesting. But the word that Paul uses actually is going back to the Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, weighing is not just about determining weight. Actually, the word, when you go to, to a market, you would quite often buy something in bulk, and then you would fill up your, your, your cloth or your bag, and then it would be weighed in order to determine what you have to pay. So the, the word kavat, I'm speaking Hebrew here, sorry, means to establish the value. And that word Paul uses in the Greek of our text. So when he t speaks about testing, weighing, it's about determining the value. And so you weigh carefully because you want to know exactly how good it is that you've got it. And you do that with everything, with all the prophecies, everything that is said for the upbuilding of the congregation, you appreciate for its merits. What benefits the congregation as it awaits the coming of the Lord, that is good. So the apostle understands that not all benefits the saint's walk of life. And so he simply states, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And it is interesting that in the original, the apostle does a bit of a wordplay when he says, hold fast, let go. I'm an old dude. I think it sounds a little bit like a country song, but that's for some to figure that out. Keep what is good, get rid of what is evil. Whatever does not serve the congregation, leave it alone. On the other hand, what serves the congregation should be accepted, embraced, and you should own it. Do not neglect what is said for edification. Work with it. Be the display of the great work of God in Christ. In other words, it is about the Spirit's work. It is about the Spirit's work not being rejected but accepted. It's about the Word and the work of the Spirit, and so it is about the Word and the work of the church, of the members. That involves 
knowing your stuff as well as doing your stuff. If there's something wrong in the abstaining from every form of evil, go back to the commandment to hold fast what is good, which is the work of the Spirit. If there is something wrong in the working with the prophecies, return to the commandment not to despise prophecies, which is the word of the Spirit. If there's something wrong in the rejecting of the Spirit, return to the commandment, do not quench the Spirit. You embrace the Spirit as a person. Congregation, brothers and sisters, the Apostle charges the church to heed the three commandments of do not, so that the gospel heard may bear fruit in the lives of God's people, so that the Spirit of God is pleased, so that the confessed truth may be the experienced truth. For in the obedience to these commandments, we find that God answers the prayer of the Apostle. We read it further on in our text. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In that way, our preparation for things coming will be a blessed experience. When you are well prepared, you won't be surprised when Jesus comes again, that you'll be ready and joyful. Amen.